Welcome to the State of the Pork Industry Report, brought to you by Neogen. Neogen is committed to fueling a brighter future for global food security through the advancement of human and animal well-being. Harnessing the power of science and technology, Neogen Corporation has developed comprehensive solutions spanning the food safety, livestock, and pet health and wellness markets. A world leader in these fields, Neogen has a presence in over 140 countries with a dedicated network of scientists and technical experts focused on delivering optimized products and technology for its customers. Hi, my name is Jennifer Scheich, and I serve as the editor and brand leader for Farm Journal's Pork. I have the privilege of spending my days covering pork industry issues and news, as well as telling stories of the people in our industry and exploring topics to help the industry grow. In this episode, we will take a deeper look at sow and grow finish performance from Meta Farms between July 1st and September 30th, 2024. And we're going to take a look at what this could mean on the farm through the lens of our experts, Dr. Kara Hayden, Adam Anagers, Randy Keeker, and Brad Eckberg. But before we jump into the data, we've sure had a lot going on amongst this group. First, congratulations, Adam. Can you tell us about your new addition to the family? I know the last time we talked, there were some people in this group who will remain nameless who were just a little bit worried if you would be able to handle changing the diapers and doing all the things again. So give us the truth. How's it going? Well, so little little Liam joined us uh, August 25th. He was about uh, three weeks early, um, but he's doing really well now. Um, gaining weight, being a baby, and yes... I was a little rusty changing diapers. I got really good at changing outfits due to being rusty at changing diapers, but I think we're over that now. Um, but but really his mom, she carries, you know, 90, 95% of the torch with the little guy. And uh, nope, we're just happy he's a healthy little baby doing good now. Awesome. Well, we are so happy to hear that. I am always amazed, like my youngest is 10. And there are so many cool new things that keep coming along for babies that, you know, just different contraptions and devices. I don't know if you've seen that too, Kara, but I'm always just a little yes. bit jealous of all of the um, new baby technology that's out there today. I'm, I'm kind of old school on that. So I've, I've got all the DVDs of, you know, Bambi and uh, all, all that old stuff. So we're, we're going to stay retro with this one and yeah. we're going to. We're going to keep some of the new stuff out of the way. He'll figure all that out as he goes on anyway, but it we keep it pretty well. simple. Good, good. Well, congratulations. We're really happy for you. Yeah, thank you. So, hey, Brad, what's been your favorite thing to do in the fall? Um, I know you are pretty busy crunching numbers all the time, but when you're not working on data, what are some of the things that keep you busy? Well, uh, the fall season in Minnesota is uh, probably the best time of the year to be uh, living here. Uh, we're probably two months away from snow and ice and all the that fun cold season of six months that we get to deal with here. So really just uh, during the fall season, um, actually just took the family up northern uh, to northern Minnesota here two weeks ago, did some uh, rustic camping. I mean, it was it was pretty cold, uh, but uh, it was actually a lot of fun and just trying to get a last minute uh, camping and out uh, outdoor activities again before it starts snowing and everything. So it's been a lot of fun. Yeah, I went to um, Southwest Michigan for a story shoot the other day and I was just the leaves were just perfect. It was such a, it was a beautiful drive. And um, around here, you know, we just don't have as many trees. So I, I get a little envious of, of all of the um, fall foliage in other places because where I'm at, there's just a lot of corn and soybeans and not a lot of that, that scenery. So soaking it all in sounds good to me. So Kara, I've been anxious to find out of the real story about how the Hayden family's farms pumpkin season's been, you know, how it went, I guess, because you're officially closed. Is that correct for the season? We, we are officially closed and officially exhausted. <laughs> um, I mean, it was, it was exhausting, but it was super great. I mean, we got to see our community come out to support us. It was so fun to just meet a bunch of people and, I don't know that there's anything better than watching people just have an absolute blast with their family for a couple hours. Um, I mean, our kids ran around, made friends, had an absolute blast. It was it was a really great couple of weeks. And where where was that located at again? 
Independence, Iowa. Okay. Yep. Well, people will have to note that for next year if you guys <laughs> do this again, where they could maybe do a little fall trip. But it sure looked, the pictures looked amazing and lots of smiles and happy people. So that's cool that you guys are doing that. And what about you, Randy? What have you been up to this fall? Been a pretty low key for us. Um, just also got the last of the cabs house and got the hay in the barn and we're just balling down and getting wood cut and getting ready for when pretty simplistic lifestyle for us. Brandy, I'm going to have you just say that again. I'm just going to kind of restart this to see um, if you could answer that again because you're kind of cutting out on us. So um, maybe we'll try. So, Randy, what have you been up to this fall? What's been keeping you busy? Um, not a whole lot going on at our household. Uh, we got some our calves sold for the fall and uh, got the hay put in the barn and just kind of getting some wood cut up and get ready for the winter season and just taking it easy. Well, I think we all need kind of those breaks to kind of get ready for what's ahead. And um, I know for us, October, I kept thinking this would be an easier fall because my daughter went off to college but it feels like we're just busier than we've ever been because we have a little freedom. And so we're just taking advantage of doing all the things. So we just got back from going to the American Royal with our two younger kids where we showed sheep, pigs, and a goat. So we were running between three different areas and three different shows, but it was our youngest daughter's first time to show there. And she had a lot of fun. Um, and we also just went to Starkville, Mississippi. So that was kind of a fun drive too. My sister's down there. Um, her husband's a strength coach for the football team. So we kind of get to see a little bit of the, the football experience behind the scenes. So lots of fun. And now it's back to work. And now it's time to, to transition and take a look at the numbers in the latest report here. So Brad, could you start us off with an overview of the Q3 numbers? Yeah, definitely. So thanks. So yeah, utilizing kind of the MetaFarms egg platform uh, the, on the south side, utilized uh, the data from 340 sow farms, almost a million sows um, is what that consists of from uh, customers in Australia, Canada, and the U.S. Uh, a lot of positivity, actually, for the Q3 2024 numbers. Uh, pigs weaned per mated female per year were at 26.9. That's up 0.7 from the same time last year. So that's a lot of positivity. That can be attributed to higher farrowing rates uh, this year, uh, as well as uh, higher uh, born alive and lower stillborn. So a lot of positivity on around there. Uh, pigs weaned per sow farrowed was at 12. Uh, so that was actually a nice increase from almost, almost a half pig from the same time last year. So producing a lot of uh, pigs, keeping a lot of pigs, having a higher farrowing rate, which is great. And then we'd be remiss if we didn't kind of cover the sow mortality and uh, some positivity there as well. So decreased in sow mortality by 1.2 percent uh, this same time from last year. Uh, so we're down to 14.9, still a little higher than I think we all want to have, but uh, we're trending the right way. So a lot of positivity um, on the south side from a production standpoint. Brad, why is that so significant right now in the state of where we're at in the industry? Well, like right now, um, for a couple of reasons, I guess I could think of. So from obviously from a mortality standpoint and sow is something that this industry has been really struggling with for some time. We're all very aware that the trends have been going up and up, but this year looks like we're going to be lower than um, really the, I think we're gonna just probably see the first yearly decline in almost six years um, from our database. So a lot of positivity, I think, you know, Dr. Hayden will probably touch base on some of it, but we've really been focused a lot on animal welfare, animal husbandry, you know, obviously from a Prop 12 pen gestation, we've had some challenges that we've kind of had to adapt to with that, but really just a, a really focus from an industry standpoint with uh, sow mortality and how do we keep that lower? And finally, you know, right now, the pigs that we're breeding are going to be uh, producing wean pigs that will be eventually be marketed this time next summer. So the pigs that are being um, bred uh, will ultimately be sold at the highest price next year. So it's really important to keep those sows alive, keep them productive um, for that, uh, you know, the hopefully uh, high revenue summer months. 
you know, I, I think there's probably obviously several reasons for why, you know, there's a decrease, but Dr. Hayden, what are you seeing? What do you think are some of those reasons? I've been to some conferences this fall where they keep talking about purse breaks being uh, less this year than they have been um, in previous years. Um, talk to us a little bit about what's the state um, from your perspective of PERS on these farms and, and other reasons why the decrease in mortality has been happening. Yeah, I mean, I would agree with Brad. This has been a huge industry focus. And man, as a veterinarian, I feel like finally this is a win that we're finally going the right direction because as an industry, we have put so much effort um, into trying to get reductions in cell mortality. So I think it's multifactorial. There's a lot of causes, but certainly PERS is absolutely a factor. So just some numbers from past years, uh, from the MSHIMP data. So 2011 to 2012, 40% PERS incidence rate. 2017 to 2018, 35% uh, incidence rate for PERS in our industry. 23 to 24, we were less than 20%. It is absolutely hands down the best PERS year we've had uh, since we started tracking PERS incidents. Um, and so really exciting. I think there's probably some reasons for that. Um, so one of them being just it made financial sense last year if you broke with a bad enough purse strain to do a deep pop repop. And so we weren't we weren't putting a lot of purse positive pigs on feed. Um, and so that unfortunately, that dynamic has fortunately and unfortunately, that dynamic has shifted back. And so we're back to, to doing more like herd closures and rollovers where we're going to be placing a lot more positive pigs this fall. So. I absolutely think PERS incidence has to do with this reduction in sound mortality. And I'm very interested to see what this 24, 25 year looks like. We're off to a great start so far. Well, it's really nice to hear some positive news because this has been a year that there certainly have been a lot of things to get excited about, but there's been a lot of things that have been pretty hard on, on pork producers this year. So it's nice to hear that. You know, Adam, from your perspective, what are you seeing daily on the sow farm? What are you seeing out there as far as reasons that sow mortality has declined? Uh, yeah, def definitely echo that we are trending the right direction and uh, what a huge relief that is. But, you, you know, we still have four or five percent of opportunity out there. And, you know, a big thing that we're working on is you know, a lot of focus on what we can control. You know, we we can identify those girls that need to be treated uh, earlier and, and get medication into them. And, it, you know, we, we can select highest quality gilts with good leg structures as, you know, we have OPG and, and Prop 12 farms. And, and then body condition score is probably the most important thing that we can do for our sows is keeping her in the right condition all the time. And then... Uh, um, just really push the details, focus on what we can control, and uh, we'll be a lot better off. So those are some of the things that we're doing to, to help reduce that mortality. So Randy, how does this translate for you? Um, are the lower sow mortalities having an impact as far as what you're seeing in regards to the wean pigs that are coming through for you? Um, what, what is that connection or tie, do you think? Uh, it's, it's hard for us to quantify in the finishing side um, if that's having an impact. I, I would say the one thing that we can see is we are seeing a lot healthier pigs over the last six to nine months. Um, I'm getting better startups on my pigs. I'm dealing with less respiratory issues. And of the flows that I see, um, we've had less instances of PERS breaks from the south farms and less lateral breaks in our area than what we dealt with a year ago. So um, from the from the prolapses issue, there's not much that I can see on my end, but overall health of that wing pig coming in the door and the amount of lateral disease that we're dealing with is definitely trended downwards, which is a very nice change. Great. Well, Brad, it looks like there's something new from the Metafarms Q3 2024 sow production index. There's a comparison of sow productivity by pigs weighted per mated female per year. Can you explain why this was added and why there would be a benefit for those who use this type of information on the farm? Yeah, definitely. Absolutely. So I, I always try to uh, bring us something new um, when we can to uh, our users of our data. And one of the things that gets asked quite a bit is what are the best doing? Um, you know, what does that actually look like? 
So for this um, for this quarter, the new it would be where we're looking at the the performance from pigs we impermeated female per year and kind of looking at different ranges and stuff. So um, what does the best of the best look like? So for the pigs we impermeated female per year averages of thirty or more um, per sow. Uh, from our database in Q three, there was nineteen percent of the farms. Uh, are over 30 pigs we impermeated per female per year. Um, the the uh, less than 20 pigs we impermeated per female per year, there's still 10% of those farms out there. Um, so there's definitely a wide difference when you look at a performance between those best farms and those bottom end farms. For example, uh, when you look at from a total born perspective, just out of the gate, what is the opportunity that I have to create wean pigs? Those uh, 30 and greater are at 16.5, whereas the less than 20 pigs we have made a female per year were at 15. And then when you look at it from a born alive standpoint, the greater than 30 were at 14.9. So 14.9 pigs born alive is what those greater than 30 have. And then the um, the average born alive for those um, less than 20 were at 12.6. So that is a 2.3 pigs born alive difference between the top end and the bottom end. So when you kind of look at that and it kind of is a, it continues to progress through the, the cycle, I mean, we're producing 12.5 pigs per sow uh, farrowed for those greater than 30. That's just, that's just a huge number. Um, so a lot of positivity out there, um, you know, from overall industry. And as, as we look at it, I mean, I remember when I was, in sow production 20 some years ago, we were hoping to hit 24 uh, from a pig's weaning from a female per year. Now we've got almost 20% of the farms that are greater than 30. So Adam, those highly productive sow farms are breeding less repeats. Do you think it's a mere coincidence? And if not, why? No, I don't think it is. And in, in any farm that, that has the right situation uh, where they don't need to breed those repeats. So if you get a uh, 50 or 55 percent conception rate, feral rate on repeats, you're doing really well. So just not breeding them from the get-go, um, you know, that 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 great, greatly helps all the way around. So, but in order to do that, parity structure has to be right. You know, replacement guilt flow has to be right. Uh, Got to be a pretty healthy herd with without guilt interruptions, um, but not not breeding returns will definitely help squeeze another two or three points out of a uh, conception rate, feral rate, um, which turns into to just more pigs wing per mated female. So it, it really is a complicated equation when you look at the whole big picture, but uh, executing um, whatever protocols that, that you have, um, you know, in the pig industry, there's many different companies and many different protocol books, but 90% of the protocols are really the same across all the boards. So, you know, those teams that, that can execute daily um, protocols, making right decisions, and um, th they'll share that success. So, you know, just executing every day, that is a, a big focus for us uh, where, where the farms that I'm working with are. Dr. Hayden, how does the guilt management change that we see on farms um, for example, if they decide to remove repeats rather than breeding, what can be the financial impact for those south farms with a higher replacement rate? Yeah. So first, I think, uh, I mean, Adam said that we can do this in really specific cases. And so um, I just want to, you just have to pay attention to the disease status. And so if you have gilts that break with flu right after they come in or mycoplasma pneumoniae or PERS, right, we can't be quite as judgmental if those girls return. This is for really healthy farms where those gilts are not having a pretty significant health challenge around the time of breeding. And so if you can rule that out, then I think that you are selecting for animals that uh, have really good reproductive capabilities. So that's great, but you have to then, just what you said, you have to manage your guilt flow. So if you're bringing a hundred gilts in now, 
and you're kind of selecting for feet and legs and all the other things we select for, and then you're not uh, breeding returns, uh, that's going to be a lower number of the gilts that you brought in that actually enter your herd. And so you need to be doing some math on, okay, what am I going to do? Is, is it worth the cost of bringing in those additional gilts um, so that I can continue to have the same parity structure and cull at the same rates? And so it really is just kind of a math equation looking at culls, Builds, it's a space equation. And then obviously you've got to be thinking about that disease piece as well. So Adam, another trend that I'm seeing is the highly productive sow farms have lower wean to first service intervals. What are farms doing to have a low interval rate? And what are those farms with high interval rates doing? Yeah. So, you know, those, those highly productive farms with a low uh, wean to first service, you know, once again, it really starts with body condition maintaining proper body condition all the way through and, and but it, it backs all the way up to you know guilt selection did we did we select the right guilt did we heat no service that guilt before we bred her did we get her bred at the right age and weight then we can maintain that body condition um, she'll go into the farrowing house have a litter of pigs then taking care of that sow making sure she gets started on feed and water right away really that first three or four days uh, of that litter dictates her subsequent, you know, breeding performance. So getting that sow started on feed and water, getting her up and going right after farrowing is is really vital to that. And then as long as she's feeling good and those pigs are making mom work, she's going to eat a lot, like a lot of lactation feed. So really driving that intake that just helps the whole process all the way through. So when she's ready to wean, she's in good shape. She's ready to eat ready to come back into uh, estrus and start the cycle again. So the, the farms that have a longer wean to first service interval, you know, we need to ask ourselves why. Um, did, did we not do all the steps in front of that, you know, right? Were we a little bit off on something? Um, you know, did we have something health-wise come in and, and cause problems? And we're now farrowing groups that really were at peak seasonal infertility. Uh, so there's some variation there that happens 16 weeks ago when we bred her in the middle of summer. Um, so there's a lot of farms that are leveling out breeding groups right now. So we don't have, you know, really big upswings. We're really focusing on 5% above or below our breeding target uh, just to keep a steady, consistent flow coming. So the farms that do those really well are really in the driver's seat. And, uh, you, you know, the farms that have some challenges up and down, that's where you've got to do some different management strategies to uh, keep that consistency through there. So it, it really sounds like a broken record, but it just always goes back to get the basics right, focus on the basics, execute those at a high level, and uh, in the long run, you're going to be in good shape. So Dr. Hayden, from a veterinarian's perspective, what are some of those basics that South Farm employees um, can make sure they're implementing to directly impact the number of wean pigs that are produced? Yeah, I don't think that we can underestimate how important caregivers are and how a different caregiver can drive different numbers. So you can have a really healthy farm and it can have very different performance depending on the caregivers and kind of their ability to take care of the sows. And so we need caregivers that can walk into a farrowing room and immediately note if it's too hot or too cold. So too cold, we're going to get scours and piglets. Too hot, we're not going to get the feed intakes that we need. So we need caregivers who can walk down a row and immediately identify a sow that maybe doesn't have a full belly or is not getting up and eating and drinking immediately post farrowing. We need caregivers that can identify those sows and know exactly what to do to jump in, to get her up, get her eating, provide her with an anti-inflammatory or potentially an antibiotic. Um, we need caregivers who understand things like... Um, you know, Adam was talking about wean to first service. Uh, you can really mess up the wean to first service interval by moving a ton of pigs around in your farrowing house and making a bunch of nurse sows that maybe aren't necessary. That disrupts that lactation. Uh, it can be hard for piglets to get reestablished on teats. And so caregivers that understand that their job is to, as much as possible, keep those pigs on their own mom or in the litter that they were sorted to. Um, yeah, it's Caregivers make such a huge difference, but it's basic things about being able to notice problems with the environment and respond right away and to be able to notice individual animal problems again and to respond right away. Yes. 
Well, you know, I can hear the wind blowing pretty hard outside my window right now. So, I mean, fall season is definitely uh, underway. And with that is coming colder temperatures. It's been getting pretty chilly around here at night. Um, harvest is is definitely in full swing and, and kind of finishing up for a few people around here. It's, it's pretty well done right around me. But I know in other parts of the county, there's still a lot going on. But I guess as we think about that transition and what's coming ahead, Adam, what are some of the things that you're doing now to prepare the South Farms for colder weather? Um, and, and talk to us about some of those preparation things you're doing. You know, it is a beautiful time of year. Leaves start changing. Um, you, you can still wear shorts, but you not, might need a long sleeve shirt. Um, it's just a beautiful time of year, but also for the pig world, it's a scary time of the year because we know once crops come out, you know, we're going to start hauling manure, pumping manure, and uh, there's just going to be a lot of activity going, a lot of virus uh, out there present that wasn't there before. But, you know, being prepared, being proactive is a huge part to uh, keeping your healthy or your farm healthy through those challenges, challenging months or peak seasons. So um, once again, biosecurity is most important. Um, making sure all of our, you know, pit fans are working, making sure all of our fan covers are in place, you know, getting, getting the farms prepared before cold weather hits uh, is just a huge thing to help us get through the winter. So uh, we send out, you know, checklist, um, to help the managers make sure we don't forget anything. And and then we just, uh, myself and the regional team, we, we get out and we really inspect what we expect. And then if somebody needs help, we've, we've got to be able to jump in and help them. Um, but, but really to, to talk about the people is you've got to have a culture where somebody's not afraid to raise their hand and go, hey, I don't quite understand this. Maybe I need some help here. So uh, just letting our managers know that we really service them. We work for them. They are our bosses. So when they need help, we, we need to have a positive culture where somebody's not afraid to raise their hand because we'd rather have that than get into the thick of something and go, oh, we could have prevented this by doing this, you know. Um, so that's that's what we work on here is having a positive culture where we promote people to raise their hands and ask questions. That's a good thing. We We are all resources to them. I love that. I've been thinking about that a lot, actually, this fall and just some of the stories I've done and in our Barn Heroes features that we've been doing across the country, just talking to different, you know, heroes in the barn and the things that they're doing. You know, a big thing that I keep hearing is having a culture where people can come to them and really talk to them about things they're concerned about, things that maybe they've messed up, things they don't understand very well. And um, it just really reinforces to me the importance of having uh, people who are good communicators on your team who are able to um, be good listeners and and be good facilitators of that conversation. You know, Dr. Hayden, there's also a lot of things that we need to think about right now when it comes to the safety of our South Farm employees uh, during this time of the year, too, as we're, as we're doing some of these things to prep for the season ahead. So any recommendations? And also while you're at it, you know, I'd love to hear your thoughts on, on ventilation and sow units and things we need to be thinking about in that term, too. Yeah, I think um, I would agree with Adam. This is when we're checking heaters. We're closing off fans. Um, we're making sure on our filtered farms that we're not going to get backdrafts uh, when we get snowstorms, that we're not going to get snow inside the buildings. Uh, there's all kinds of things that we want to be doing from a purse standpoint. Um, and then, yeah, from a safety standpoint, we're talking about pit pumping this season. And so uh, we really, we want our employees to be safe. Um, and so at our farms, when we're pumping a sow farm, we'll increase ventilation. Um, and then we really recommend the, we've got little like tags that people can wear that kind of uh, will alarm out if there's an issue with air quality. Um, and so we highly recommend those for sow farms during the time that they're pumping. This is also the time of year where, um, and I'd love to hear Randy's thoughts about this too for Grow Finish, but where we're reminding people that even though it's getting cold, we do still have to move air. Um, and so it can be very tempting to try to save propane and to crack down on everything. But from a health standpoint, a wet, humid room with wet floors is an absolute, you are asking for hemolytic E. coli problems and for strep problems and for sick animals with respiratory. And so um, just reminding everybody, we do need to continue to get those air speeds, to get air mixing, our minimum ventilation 
ventilation needs to be high enough and we need to try to be getting dry floors, even though we're getting into that cold season. We, we talk a lot in, in the South Farms on let's not create August in yes. September through the winter months. Let, let, let August be August one time a year. We don't need to create that anymore. So, yeah, that's a very, very good point. Brandy, did you have any thoughts on that and how that's how, you know, your recommendations in the barns now? Yeah, absolutely. Um, you know, I, I'm a big proponent of using the tools that are provided to us. So with us, you know, we have Kestrel meters. All of our field advisors have Kestrel meters. Most of our sites have Kestrel meters. And when we place pigs, you know, we're checking that airspeed two to three times a week to make sure that we're not mixing too much, bringing air in too fast or too slow, uh, making sure we got plastic on the fans. Um, something as simple as where you place your your fallout pigs or your hospital pens. Some of those pens are located right by the entry doors into the barns. And when you got employees coming in and coming out through those doors, those tend to be the coldest place. So you want to maybe move those to a different area in the barn in the winter time than what you had in, in the summertime. So all of those things go into effect in this time of year. Um, and the other thing to remember is when you do have pit pumpers that are pumping pits, you better take a walk around the outside of your facility to make sure that your your shrouds and everything got put back where they were. Because I can guarantee you, you're going to find some that didn't get put back where they were supposed to be put back. So that makes your airflow inefficient. And and you're wondering, why can't I get the airspeed that I thought I was supposed to be getting? Is because you, you got two pit fans that are working and one that's not doing anything for you. So um, we just got to stay on our toes. And like Adam said, you got to have your checklist available to you to you know, it's been a year since you've gone through those checklists and some things get forgotten and it comes upon you quick and we're having 70 degree days right now and, and probably in a week or two, they're going to be 40 degree days. So um, just got to be ready for it. Points. Well, speaking of what you're doing on the Grow Finish side, let's move over to talk a little bit about those numbers. Brad, can you give us an update on the numbers on the Grow Finish side? Yeah, definitely. Thank you. So we're going to look at closed out performance uh, again from that uh, groups that have closed out for that July 1st to September 30th of 24. Um, really, I can kind of uh, uh, say from an overall perspective that it kind of breaks down into three areas to look at. I mean, from uh, higher uh, efficiencies uh, for closeouts, uh, we also have higher outweights and then mortality. So start from an efficiency standpoint, I mean, average daily gain continues to just surprise me. We had a 1.94 average daily gain for finish uh, in Q3. Uh, average daily gain for wean to finish single stock would be a 169. So really nice efficiency there. And then uh, from a fee conversion standpoint, finishing, uh, Fee conversion was a 276, where the fee conversion for wean to finish uh, groups were a 257. So, really efficient, uh, both improvements from the same time last year. And then, when we look at from a, an outweight perspective for finish and wean to finish groups, uh, both had a little over four pound increase from the same time last year. So, finishing uh, for Q3 would have been uh, two, 280 two pounds uh, from an average perspective, and then uh, uh, wean to finish would be a 281. So we still continue to uh, produce large pigs. And then from a mortality standpoint, similar to the sow death loss, we have also improved on the grow finish side. Nursery, the uh, Q3 2024 was a 319. That's uh, uh, about a third percent lower than uh, same time last year. And actually the 319 uh, mortality in nursery is the lowest uh, in the last five years. So a lot of uh, positives there. Also on positives would be from a wean to finish perspective, we got a 7.18% uh, mortality. Um, that is down uh, a little over a half percent from the same time last year. And again, similar to nursery mortality and wean to finish, um, the lowest it's been for Q3 in five years. Finishing mortality uh, down slightly at a 5.56%, um, uh, down a, a tenth from same time last year. So again, kind of just wrapping it up, just uh, uh, good efficiencies from a free conversion average daily gain perspective. Pigs continue to get heavier as we market them and mortalities are trending the right way.
That sounds like a pretty good, pretty good report right now. So, Randy, I'd like to hear from you. You know, when it looks at the nursery mortality being about one percent lower than the same period that it was in 2022, I mean that's that's significant. What do you think are some of the tools that you've seen have been impacting those mortality rates? Um, for us personally, I think some of the tools that some of our integrators have used uh, to help combat uh, E. coli has really been a big, big factor in our lowered mortality. Uh, we've seen a lot less uh, severe E. coli breaks. We battled a little bit of strep here and there, um, and then some flu we've had to deal with. But overall, I think, um, like I mentioned earlier, the biosecurity and less lateral breaks has helped us keep that, those numbers down and then the, the lower incidence of E. coli. So there's been some, you know, vaccines have been used and there's been some feed, um, some different feed ingredients or levels of zincs have been played with and have, have lowered that number of, of instances or breaks with E. coli in at least in our system in the last six months. So I think that's been huge for us. The outweights in finishing and wean to finish barns continue to climb. You know, obviously producers are working so hard just to raise a pig to market weight, not to mention all the costs that go into that as well. So what are some of the industry averages for transportation losses? Yeah, from um, the med oh, real quick, Randy, I'll just kind of give you an idea from a, a MetaFarm standpoint, uh, from a DOA perspective. So pigs that are showing up at the plant dead, we're at about a quarter percent uh, is kind of what the yearly average is, you know, give or take a, a little bit uh, from a year over year perspective. So you kind of kind of what a quarter percent on a thousand pigs, that's two to uh, three pigs that are dying again on their way to transportation uh, to the packer, which means that you're putting, uh, you know, all that feed and money and time into those pigs uh, that you're getting nothing out of them. Um, and obviously from a revenue standpoint and a cost standpoint, very impactful from the bottom line. Randy, so from your perspective, what are some of the observations that you see in the increase in these transportation losses, and what do you think can be done to lower those numbers? Yeah, I would say for us, target weight, um, we see a big discrepancy for one of our clients that wants bigger pigs to the to the packer. We have a higher incidence of mortality or DOAs on the truck with those versus, you know, so we've got one that wants in 290 plus, and then we've got a lot of our other customers are in the you know, 265 to 275 range. We have we have better performance or better results with those pigs going on the truck. And then, you know, I get in there and I help the guys load and watch and observe and, and kind of do an evaluation on it. And it's just taking your time and taking smaller groups. Uh, so just more training and setting expectations to making sure people are, are moving the pigs in a responsible way so they're, they're not overstressing them and, and causing more damage than they should be. And then those things that are out of our control once they leave, um, you, we've seen quite a turnover in the trucking industry. Uh, we've got one hauler that that we work with that has, in the last seven months, had like 100% turnovers with new drivers. Um, so making sure that those drivers are getting trained properly um, and making sure that they're they're doing the things they're supposed to be doing, but it's kind of out of our control once they leave our yard. So that's what I'm seeing. Employee turnover is hard no matter where that occurs, isn't it? You know, Dr. Hayden, do you have any other helpful tips when it comes to reducing losses in transportation, especially in regards to a heavier pig? Yeah, I mean, I think one thing that we need to remind caregivers a lot is, especially if a pig was sick in the nursery, they might have a reduced lung capacity when we go to load that truck. Um, and these these are not athletic animals, so we are not breeding pigs to be athletic. They're they're just not used to uh, walking across a barn and up a ramp and into a truck. And so we just need to remind our caregivers that this is a high stress event and that the best thing that we can do for outcomes is to remain calm to exactly what Randy said and move small groups. Um, there's a lot of things we can do from a barn setup standpoint. Um, pigs, we, we need to not forget that pigs are a, a prey species. And so even though there's, there's no wolves in our pig barns, they're still very much bred to think that there could be a wolf around any corner. And so making sure that we have really good lighting, that the air is going the right direction, that the trucker is tucked up out of the way, uh, that we're remaining calm, that we're not allowing other pigs to get really stressed and to release stress pheromones and to vocalize and to get that entire group ramped up on stress. Those are all things that we just need to take everything down a notch and just go low and slow as we're loading. Um, another thing, studies would consistently show 
that the more time that caregiver spends in the pens with the pigs prior to marketing, the lower stress those marking, sorting, and loading events are going to be on the pig. And so encouraging our caregivers prior to marketing is when we kind of start ignoring groups because they're, they're just about to be out of our hair. That's really when we need to be boots on the ground in the pens, getting them used to the presence of people. Uh, that's, that's an excellent point. I just am always amazed. Like you can just tell the really good farms when you walk through them with people and you just see those pigs, whether we're talking sows or whether we're talking grow finished pigs, how they respond to the people in the barns. And not all barns are the same. So I think that's a good reminder, you know, and, and also I was listening to one of our, one of the guys I interviewed, just, you know, talk about how much he loves to move pigs. And I it just kind of struck me. He's like, I love moving pigs. Some people don't. He's like, I do. And there's the right way to do it, you know, and just acknowledging and getting excited about our employees who, who are excited about what they do and doing a good job of it, I think is really important. And um, it really fuels success, I think. So great points. You know, Brandy, how does this new crop corn and cooler temperatures, how are those things affecting grow finished pigs right now? Yeah, we've got some groups that once we switched over to new crop corn, they just really exploded. You know, intakes went up and and they just uh, they packed on the weight pretty fast. Um, but another potential problem that we had this year that we didn't have last year was when we were finishing up with our old crop and new crop, you know, we had some different moisture contents in there. And we were having some issues with flowability with some of that new and old with, you know, different moistures. And when it went through the roller mill, we got a little bit of deviation and we got some flowability issues that, you know, so it, it led to a few out of feed events or the potential for out of feed events. If our caretakers weren't watching it pretty closely, uh, luckily we do have some bin sentry and we do have uh, maximum systems that give us alarms whenever we do have a max runtime or whatnot. But that was, that was something that caught us off guard a little bit this year. Uh, didn't do much damage for us at all. Like I said, with the technology that we have in place, um, but when we set our projections for one of our customers, you know, eight weeks ago on what these pigs were going to weigh, and then we sent some to to market, and you know, we kind of got a little behind on our marketing, and and pigs really took off on us. So, um, it's something we're always trying to be prepared for every year, and sometimes you win, and sometimes you get a little bit behind. But uh, it was it was a pretty good year for us, and, and glad to see those weights come up. But you just got to be ready for it. Excellent. Well, uh, there were so many good takeaways from our conversation today. And one of my favorite parts of, of our you know chats during the State of the Pork Industry reports is just to, to wrap things up with you guys and to listen to some of the, the positives or, or the challenges and opportunities that you see in the report um, that we can take away and things that we can think about as we build for the future. So, you know, what would be some of your um, thoughts for producers as, as you look towards the future? Randy, would you like to start us off? Oh, some thoughts or challenges. Um, you know, we always talk about labor, and I guess labor would be the, the go-to for me. Um, I work with the Illinois pork producers, and, and they're looking for ways to kind of open up that TN portal again. Uh, they've had some promising conversations with some state legislators and some, I think, some congressmen out in D.C. that they're hoping that they found maybe where the bottleneck was that can open that back up. Um, we'll we'll be interested to see where that's going to go over the next two to three months. Yeah, that's good news. Be great to figure out where that bottleneck is for sure. Okay, Adam, what about you? What are some of your key thoughts and takeaways from this report? You know, it's it's great to see that the industry is making some positive moves. Um, that's that's something we haven't been to say been able to say as an industry and in, in all three areas, whether you know breed to wean. Um, nursery and finishing. So um, it really share the success with the teams. And, you know, labor is an extreme challenge for us right now. So um, spending a lot of time developing that positive culture uh, who, who people want to be a part of, uh, because without them, we, we wouldn't have an industry. So in a scenario where, you know, new employees coming is is more challenging and pig production is improving, uh, to me, that's just a really good time to share the successes. It's real easy for us to to point out opportunity areas. And I think sometimes we forget to really focus on the wins. So um, try to help spread some of that enthusiasm and positivity on 
where we're headed as a, as an industry right now. Let's not forget that. Love that. Focus more on the wins. We're trying to do that. Even, you know, at Farm Journal, we get so busy with what we're doing every day. And on Fridays, we try to at least circle around and say, what were some of the wins that you had this week? And how do we build on some of the wins? And, and I think that's a good advice probably for all of us in our homes too. You know, there's just so easy to focus on the challenges. And sometimes we forget to just stop and celebrate the wins a little bit. Very good advice. Um, Brad, what about you? What are some of your key thoughts and takeaways? I've been here at Meta Farms for a little over 10 years now. And, and uh, while we're kind of hopefully coming out of a uh, really tough couple of years from a financial standpoint um, in the pork industry, I've also been here when there's been some really good uh, financial times. And one of the observations that I've made is, is when times are really good financially, the usage of reports and analytics and comparisons um, by some of our customers really drops. I, I think, I don't know if we get just kind of, we rest on our laurels a little bit. We don't uh, pay attention to the small things, but when times are tough financially, boy, there's a lot of usage um, in our analytics uh, within MetaFarms. And I'm just gonna give you a couple of uh, areas to kind of look at or think about from a sow and grow finish standpoint. I mean, we've got a report called the Guild Performance Report on the South side. It's a fantastic report that'll track the guilds that come in, what their P1 performance is, lifetime performance, the retention, and you know, comparing genetics, comparing the GDU source. It's a fantastic report that uh, I highly recommend looking at guilds. The estrus analysis report is a fantastic breeding report that'll cohort a breed week from start to finish. So uh, earlier we were having discussions around repeats. Well, utilizing like that report alone, you'll be able to tell that the farrowing rates uh, for repeats are about 20% lower than what uh, they are for gilts and uh, like less than seven day weans. Um, the total born average is about a half pig difference, uh, you know, give or take, um, with uh, repeats being that half percent lower. Um, but the, the bottom line is from a repeat standpoint and just putting a bow on it is the reliability of those repeats actually coming back and, and then and actually sticking this time and farrowing is something that I think a lot of producers uh, see that they're just not reliable enough. So they're breeding less of those animals. On the grow finish side, it's a lot about comparisons. Um, so uh, two big things that I'm seeing a lot from a, an observational standpoint is, is uh, our customers are comparing feeder type, water type, ventilation types. They're comparing genetic closeout performance. They're they're comparing their best growers and bottom end growers, and they're um, comparing their their employees as well from a supervisor standpoint. Or you know maybe they have got load crews. Uh, maybe there's management companies that they're really evaluating, you know, who is, who is, uh, you know, the best and who's the worst and where can we uh, look for opportunities. And speaking of opportunities, the last shameless little plug would be uh, from a comparison standpoint is we've got a report called the group treatment report. It's a fantastic report to look at medication usage um, and kind of a cost benefit analysis a little bit. So, you know, how much product am I using? Uh, out there from a medication standpoint and am I getting the performance from them? So utilizing data um, more and uh, less of the gut, more of the data driven. Great reminder, great reminder. And Dr. Hayden, how about you? What are some of your final key takeaways? Well, I think, so one of my key takeaways is not something that we really talked about on the call today, but I have sat in on some of the coolest presentations regarding new technology that's going to be available in the next few years. And I just think that we are about, we as an industry, we are about to take just huge steps forward in technology. So we talk about having caregivers that can identify six sows earlier and how incredibly important that is. We are coming into a time period where technology is going to be able to do that for us where our caregivers will be able to come into a barn and get kind of a list of this is a pig that didn't go to the feeder enough. This is a pig that didn't walk around enough today. This is a pig that has a fever um, identified by some of this technology. Um, and I just, I've seen more of this stuff that's being implemented in Europe or that is, I mean, coming into farms to do some trialing. I am so excited about the future of our industry especially just, I mean, just imagine as a caregiver, if you can come into the barn and just really focus on the pigs that need it 
and that you're given all of the tools that you need to identify those pigs that need care, the environments that are not perfect. I mean, I just think as an industry, we're about to take a huge step forward and I'm really excited. Well, and I might throw back to you too. How do you think that impacts the people that we can attract to come work in the barns um, and the people that we can keep in the barns? Because to me, there's, there's a lot of synergy there. Oh, absolutely. I just think uh, we're going to be able to have people who love working with camera technology. And um, yeah, I, I just think it, it, it just opens up a whole world for our industry as it's more of a more of a job where you're coming in, you're interacting with technology, you're interacting with pigs, uh, maybe doing less of the kind of grunt work that you hate and more of the like really specific getting into the nitty gritty with animals. And I think that that draws really great people to our industry. Yeah, I think it's a great way to draw younger people who are going to be, you know, are growing up with technology that, you know, I I didn't grow up with some of those things. So I'm learning as I go. I kind of feel like my generation is sort of in the middle there, but this younger generation, I mean, it's, it's all they know. And so going to be in a barn where they're utilizing that and they get to work with animals, I think there's a lot of pluses there. So Definitely a great point to bring up. You know, I know you guys are busy. I know you're in the barn, some of you right now are getting ready to head off to your next things. So I just really want to say, you know, thank you for your time and insights today. Um, I want to thank all of you listeners and viewers for joining us for the State of the Pork Industry Report hosted by Farm Journals Pork and brought to you by Neogen. Uh, We really would love to hear more from you about topics you would like to see us discuss next time. So I'm going to commit to trying to do a better job of asking as we get ready for the Q4 report to come out. Uh, Be watching on social media or send me an email or reach out to any of our um, experts on this um, and let us know what you'd like us to talk about because we'd love to address some of the challenges and questions that you're seeing in the barns. Another way you can stay connected with us is at porkbusiness.com. Again, I hope you guys have a great day and enjoy this beautiful fall weather.